Shields, it didn't matter where you went. Uh, your lodging and accommodations were seven and a half pence for your space in the room. And that's what I, I emphasize space in the room. You're not getting the whole room. You might have 17 other people in that room. Depending on what time of day you arrive, in terms of whether or not you get uh, part of the bed, you might be sure that bed with three or four other people. Uh, or, or you might end up with a pallet on the floor. Uh, a few taverns uh, might have one or two private rooms, but you're going to have, to have pretty good means to be able to get that for yourself. Uh, we do know that Weatherford's Tavern across the street, one of the prominent uh, local uh, residents, uh, Colonel Rand Page, did have a private room there. But he had the money. He came from a very prominent family. He could afford it. Uh, not everybody could. So uh, these prices are regulated, and you're going to pay the same no matter where you go. But where the money is really to be made for someone like Mr. Salvo is the private room. The clubbing rooms, the Apollo room, we he was gonna have subscription balls where every Thursday in a month you could you could buy tickets on all that Thursday you're gonna have a dance. And we liked our dancing in Virginia. Instead of us, we would rather die than not dance. So we like to have a good time. Now on Wednesdays you might have your subscription ball at Weatherburn. So if you want to find a dance, you can find just about every day of the week, just about, because we did enjoy our entertainment. But again, it's the private room. That's where Mr. Salvo and other tavern owners are going to make the money. Because if you want to arrange for it, and Mr. Washington and others might have the money, and certainly would, they want prime rent, they're going to get prime rent as long as they pay for it. You know, Mr. Salvo has no problem accommodating them as long as he pays, gets the money for it. So that's where the real money is to be made. But what often happens when you have a war? What happens to prices? They can go up. We have a price sheet from York County in 1780. Uh, that, uh, that diet, that dinner, is going to cost you four pounds, six shillings. A quart of wine that would cost you somewhere between three to five shillings in 1772 will now cost you 18 pounds. And people are wondering, well, uh, tell us again why we're fighting this war. Uh, so it was, it was uh, getting a little, little dicey to say the least, um, but that can happen. Things get hard to get, the prices will escalate accordingly. But of course the Raleigh Tavern will be important uh, not just because of the food, or even the dancing, because those private rooms can be used for political purposes, and they were. Because certain men like Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, George Washington, at times they were talking about things that if you're a member of the House of Burgesses, uh, you can't really be openly talking about maybe non-importation of British goods, uh, or maybe call up all 13 colonies together in a grand congress. You could get in just a little bit of trouble if the royal governor, of course, the Parliament the King find out about that, so you need to get someplace where you can discuss your plans a little discreetly and not worry about it getting out. And they knew they could trust Mr. Salvo. If you will, what happens at the Raleigh stays at the Raleigh. Uh, and, and they knew they could trust Mr. Salvo, but there's no coincidence that later 
he will be a member of the Committee of Observation enforcing the non-importation agreement. So they understood that he was on their side, and they could certainly trust him to be discreet about the things. But again, uh, it's always the private rooms. Now, we won't be able to fit anybody in, but as we head to the bar room, we're going to see the clubbing room. Now, clubbing may mean something different than where you're from, I'm not sure. But the clubbing in the 18th century means gentlemen rent that room out, and they are distributing the cost of the entertainment, however they want the table set up. And you'll notice the clubbing room here is set up for what was probably the second most popular thing in Virginia, cards. So follow me, we'll pass the clubbing room into the bar room. Certain spirits will be stored, and uh, you can arrange for services to, to take that beverage, whether it's wine, uh, ales, whatever it may be. Uh, but Dara was Mr. Washington's favorite. Um, and, and, and again, uh, people think sometimes I'm making this up, but uh, the, one of the most well known barkeepers that ever worked here at the Royal Tavern, he was here for some years, and was Mr. Drinker. That was his name, not me, Mr. Drinker. Uh, so he did uh, quite well for himself, but uh, again, during, when, when the bar is closed, then the, uh, the other bars are lower because you know, to protect what, so people can't get down at what's in the cellar, because again, some of this is very valuable property, especially during the war. You know, it's the thing for you to get, you have to protect them. Uh, that's what this room is for. Um, again, part of the ways that you're making money through some of like Mr. Southall. It's in the private rooms, the bar room. Uh, uh, catering to the needs because, again, by the time of the war, only Weatherbridge rivaled the Raleigh uh, as far as having the finest entertainment uh, and being considered uh, the best tavern in town. In fact, it's one of the reasons why it was one of only two or three that survived the Revolutionary War after they moved to the capital of Richmond uh, and kept operating as a tavern until the original burn in 1859. So, um, this, this was a, a place that uh, uh, it was prominent for many, many reasons. So um, I'm not sure, uh, there may be someone in the pub room who may be able to uh, Seating available here, I believe, but uh, I will allow. Uh, of course, yielding the chairs to the ladies first. Yes, that's always uh, ladies. the proper manner. Uh, enjoy the rest of your visit with us, and then I will turn you over to her uh, capable hand. And if there are um, chairs left, of course, the men sit down, the men next sit down. The you all are new to Spitch, Mulberry, where are you traveling from? North Carolina. North Carolina? And you all have not had dinner? You haven't? No. You haven't? You don't know if you had dinner? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out why you knew. I have never been in the Raleigh Tavern in the Apollo room with 30 people and it had been this quiet before. Yeah, no, I didn't. Oh, oh, well. 
I am just here. Um, I'm afraid that I didn't have to leave. I was hoping to see some of my friends here to acquaint them with um, the results of my sister's case. And since you were saying that you're from North Carolina, then I can acquaint you with what's happened. And if you can do the kindness of passing that on to my friends, they are setting up something in the next two rooms, some amusements. You'll see the food laid out. Does that sound agreeable? Oh, yes. 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 Now, my sister and I, we have been here to the city for, I've been here a few years. My sister's been here for about a year. And we are laundresses and seamstresses. Now, my sister was in our home. I was there as well. But she agreed with the gentleman to make a waistcoat for me. They decided on everything, the cloth that the waistcoat was to be made of, the, the thread, the, the buttons, and the price, which is very important. And at the time, my sister was going to construct this garment in under two months to deliver it to this gentleman. Now, she finished with two weeks to spare. I inspected everything on that waistcoat. The stitching was perfect, impeccable. Buttons, buttonholes lined up, everything laid just perfectly. And she went to deliver it to this gentleman the next day. And when she came back, she had this look of dread and upset on her face. And I, I asked her, well, what was the matter? And she said, nothing. He, he loved the Westgate. And I said, well, why is your face not lining up with what you're telling me? And she said, he didn't pay me, which is not uncommon because you all soon learn in business that often your customers will prefer credit, whereas you, if you go into business for yourselves, your preference is always ready money. That's what my parents taught me, and that's, that's good advice. See, ready money means that when you finish that transaction or service, you have cash in hand. And oftentimes, people that keep businesses, they will even offer a small discount for ready money, 5% or so. So I told her that he would probably square it up in a few weeks. But it had grown to a few months, and this gentleman had made no attempt to pay. He had not stopped by the home, nothing. So I had an idea that I was not sure was going to work, but it was something that I wanted to try for my sister's sake. Because of this, I waited until the last minute. Uh, yesterday morning, I woke my sister up very early, and I told her, Mary, we are going to court. Well, she got so upset, and she, oh, well, you would be upset if somebody told you at 6 o'clock in the morning you were going to court. And she thought that this gentleman was attempting to sue her even though she made the West get to his specifications. And I told her, Mary, you are suing him. <laughs> See, this is the part that I wasn't sure about. The law around here is, how can I put this diplomatic? There are people that write the laws. We all know who these people are, don't we? Well, certainly the types of people who write the laws. And laws are very much written in such a way to benefit those that are closest to the ones that write the laws. Do you all get what I'm saying? I'm trying to be very diplomatic. So the further away you get from being like those who write the laws, then you can understand how it's a little more difficult for you to find justice or for any wrongs committed against you to be righted. So take, for instance, my sister. Now, my sister and I were born free. That is the natural state that all people are born free, right? That is natural. The only thing that makes it different is laws that were written down to the capital. Well, actually, to the old capital in Jamestown, a law that says the status of the child is that of the mother bond or free. Now that is something decided for you before you even come into the world. So that's a lot to, to saddle a child with, isn't it? Enslavement, so we were born free, but because of our color, we are bound by many of the same laws that people that are enslaved are bound by. So there is a law that says no Negro, no Indian, no mulatto can testify against a white person in court. So how in the world was my sister going to sue this gentleman? Records. See, if you are going to keep a business, you have to keep good records. Every day, my sister and I would jot down things in a waste book. Now, that's just everything that happens in a day. 
It's, it's very frenzied, not anything that's needed or organized. And from that waste book, then we go and we copy things in our day book, and that is all the business that happens in a day, all the people that come in, and it's a much neater accounting of that day. And then we also have a journal. See, we often will deal with the same clients, and they will come in many times um, in a year. So each client will have a page, and everything, if you were to come and you would say, well, a handkerchief made, or you wanted something longer, that would all be recorded in that journal. So all three of those books went with us when we went down to the courthouse. Now I told my sister Mary to ask if it could be submitted for evidence and it was accepted and received. And the judges, when they looked and read themselves, the Westgate was made to the specifications, the cloth read the buttons, and he had not yet to pay, or attempt to pay what money he, what money he owed. So, what do you think happened? You think she won the case? Do you think she lost it? She lost. Why do you think she lost? Because of the law. Because of the law? Well, believe it or not, she won it. <laughs> See, she didn't have to say anything. I didn't have to say anything. But that is the problem, the law. There is a big difference between not having to do something and not being able to do something. My sister, or a friend of my sister and I, she says that a broken clock is right two times a day. And that's what I was thinking about a lot when it came to this case. That's true. But if in a whole day, a broken clock is right two times a day, that means that two minutes out of a 24 hour day, things are right. And that 23 hours and 58 minutes out of the day, things are not as they are. Or as they should. You get my meaning? Well, can you do me the kindness of passing that on to my friends? They're just in the, bar, uh, in the billiard room. I, I'm afraid I do have to go. There's not a lot of daylight left, so I want to do a little bit more sunlight. Can you do that for me? Okay. Thanks. Um, this company was just going to the billiard room. And oh, it's good. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, okay. Enjoy your stay in our first city. <laughs>
So but we're trying to take advantage of it uh, because you know, we want to get Parliament's attention. So we signed after the Boston Tea Party. Um, now, even before that, we are even talked about maybe if we talk about the non-importation of British goods, that's one way to get Parliament's attention. If the merchants won't like that, if it's affecting their bottom line, you, you hit the government in its pocketbook. Um, and maybe we should get all the colonies together in one big Congress. But again, you've got to be careful about talking about these things. That's why I did say, being at the Capitol, they kind of moved things over here uh, to the Raleigh. And uh, later, uh, Mr. Carr's ideas would be acted upon, uh, especially for the idea, but this time, let's come up with a committee of observation to enforce those non-importation agreements. They tried that once before after the Townsend duties in the late 1760s, but it fell apart because the colonies just weren't communicating with each other, and, and some people's desire, oh, I want some more of that British tea again, or maybe some of that English land, and because there was no means of enforcement, uh, the non-importation agreements fell apart. So this time, they, Mr. Carr said, let's, let's get a committee of observation that would enforce it, and with rules, and make sure that all 15 colonies, uh, maybe even a committee of correspondence, so that we're all communicating. Um, and unfortunately, Mr. Carr will die later in 73 before he can see his ideas implemented, but they eventually will be. And the following year, in May of 74, they decide uh, again, meeting his sweetly, let's draft a resolution for day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, because they had a pretty good idea how Dunmore is going to react. Because actually, even though he doesn't know it, he's being played. He's taking advantage of this temperament. Uh, because even though it sounds very noble to have a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer and support the people of Boston, it's a parliament that has unfairly closed the port of Boston, and, and, and we want to show support for our brethren up in Massachusetts. But we also know full well uh, that, legally speaking, only the king or his representative in Virginia can issue that type of resolution, and we pretty much know how Dunmore's going to react. Sure enough, two days after the resolution is issued on May 24th of 1774, he promptly dissolved the House of Burgesses, which actually is exactly what we wanted, because normally when a legislative session ends, you're dissolved anyway until the next election, which is normally twice a year. But men like Jefferson and Henry and others realized if they can make the governor make them private citizens sooner than normal, well, now they can get away with talking about some of these things because they're not members of the government anymore. That's exactly the way it works. Uh, they get no more to dissolve them a few months ahead of schedule. And then what does Dunmore do? He goes off to fight the Shawnee Indians the rest of the year. He's not even in, in Williamsburg. And he allows uh, Virginia to slip out of his control, and he'll never get it back. And then the following year, uh, you know, he'll start the revolution when he orders the gunpowder removed from the magazine on the main street in April of 75. But 89 members of the House that he's just dissolved, they don't go home. They probably come down here to the Apollo room. Uh, two days later, uh, in late May of 74, they draft an association for the non-importation of British goods and call for a grand congress of all 13 colonies, things they can now more easily talk about because they're private citizens, they're not members of the government. That's exactly what they're counting on. And you probably would recognize a lot of the names on this list of 89, including Peyton Randolph, George Washington, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Mason, George Mason, uh, George Witt, uh, these are, you know, all these names we're familiar with. And they took advantage of, of, of Dunmore's temperament. And Dunmore will end up after he flees Williamsburg in June of 75. He'll never come back from Williamsburg again. He intends to, but he never will. will declare independence on May 15th, 1776. Later, Patrick Henry will say the light happened, and in many ways, this was the birthplace of liberty because of the things that happened here. Uh, discussing things that led to bigger events. Uh, elsewhere that uh, helped uh, lead to our declaring that independence. But again, this room could be ran out, even though it's the billiards room, you notice what's missing from it? Billiards. No billiards table. And the original billiard, the game of billiards, was actually very similar to the lawn bowl. It started outside, and the first billiards tables were about 10 feet long. But if you did, if you wanted to do something else in the billiards room, they could basically call it a multi purpose room. You could set it up for gaming. I mentioned, you, know, you saw it earlier. Virginians love to play cards and um, you know, discuss the latest politics while you're playing. You can have other things brought in. Um, now, this game is set up for a game that I would personally recommend avoiding. It's called Catch Co. It was a three card game played with an ace through uh, uh, six. Uh, the higher cards were not used. You were dealt three cards. Um, uh, the, the chips are called fish, and the fish are in the moat. And you have a prearranged understanding how much each fish is worth. Let's just say four shillings as an example. So let's just say your bets uh, is, uh, four, is four fish. Um, 
and you already know how many shillings they might be worth, um, you decide, okay, do I, I stand on what I have, or, uh, of course, the cards would not be showing on the table, you'd be holding them in your hands, and then you deal three cards down on the table in the middle, and decide, do I need one, do I need one of those to maybe improve my hand, or do I stand on what I have? If you decide to stand, and it turns out that the other one of your playing partners has a better hand than you, you must then, for the next pot, you have to double it. So you have to go from four fish to eight. If it happens again, you go from eight to 16. From 16 to 32, you see where this is going. And you get out of hand. And that's why I, I recommend avoiding it. Uh, William Bird III, from one of the big families here in Virginia, uh, got into uh, a very bad string of luck, a game of catch go in London, and lost 10,000 pounds on a single game and basically bankrupted the family in one game of catch uh, He honored the debt, as a gentleman he never had to, but he lost the family estate of Westover as a result of that one game of catch -go. So I personally, I recommend avoiding that one. Um, the modern game of poker was derived from another game called Put. But again, the village room could be used for whatever you want, because as I said before, this is where the money is to be made for any tavern keeper is in the private rooms. Um, do you have any other uh, questions for me? Also, one other little thing you might find interesting about the Raleigh Tavern that you may not know is in December of 1776, four young students from Leland Mary met here and formed a new uh, association that today is called Phi Beta Kappa. So this is where Phi Beta Kappa was created, right here at the Raleigh Tavern uh, in 1776. So. But again, as I said, the Raleigh Tavern played a key role in the revolution uh, in many ways that people are not aware. So, if you have no other questions, I just thank you for your time with me, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, but uh, I'll, I'll let you exit out, and enjoy the rest of your visit with us, when we get the last here. Thank you for coming, everyone.